and I think that will be warmly welcomed yeah, to Linton please, Bridge of Scotland. Thank you. That ends portfolio questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 11395 in the name of Elaine Murray on tackling sectarianism. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak buttons now, and I'll give a few moments for the front benches in particular to change position. I now call on Elaine Murray to speak to move the motion. Ms Murray, 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When on the 14th of December 2011 the Scottish Government used its majority uh, to railroad through this Parliament the controversial offens offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications at Bill, the Minister for Community Safety stated that once it was passed, quote, we can get down to the difficult and long-term work of tackling sectarianism and that she wanted to begin the process of healing the divide and then celebrating the nation's differences and diversity. I'm sure we all agree that the work of the advisory group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland is an important contribution to that difficult and long-term work. The group, chaired by Dr Duncan Morrow, published its independent advice to Scottish ministers and report on activity in December last year, 70 pages detailing the history of sectarianism in Scotland, how it is manif manifest in today's Scotland, including a working definition, and recommendations to a range of institutions regarding how their attitudes and actions can help counter sectarianism. It is the most substantive piece of research carried out into this issue. The Scottish Government published its response uh, uh, to the independent advice in February, and a number of other agencies, such as COSLA, have also discussed their response to the report. But despite the Scottish Government's professed concern about sectarianism in Scotland, it has not found time to present even a statement to this Parliament, still less a debate on the report or on its response. I am aware that the Minister has asked the advisory group to continue until March next year, but that is not a valid reason to postpone discussion of the independent advice uh, by Parliament for over 15 months. Moreover, when it, it, that is when the funding of the 44 core projects is due to run out. Dean Graham. Ms Graham's microphone on, please. Cards in, uh-huh. Ah, I know I've now. got a big voice, but I will obey the rules. Uh, does the member accept that the Justice Committee on the 4th of March this year took substantial evidence from uh, the member uh, in charge of this bill, the Minister uh, for Community Safety, and from officials on this very uh, report? And she Elaine took part in it herself and asked a couple of questions. Elaine Murray. Indeed, but it's not an in-depth, what we are talking about, is an in-depth investigation by, by committees, but in particular discussion by this Parliament, given the interests of this Parliament in this, in this piece of legislation. Sorry, and, and, and the, I, because you, what we actually took evidence also was the Offensive Behaviour Act. It wasn't actually about this report, and it's this report that I'm wanting to discuss. No, I, I better press on, sorry about that. Um, the frustration of the anti-sectarian and campaigners nil by mouth has built up to such a stage that uh, before the October recess, they requested that members of, this, of the Scottish Parliament should find time to debate the report, not the bill, the report, the act. Uh, Dr Morrow himself has stated that it is vital for the, that the report and its implications are considered. The Herald, a uh, publication which is normally fairly sympathetic to the Scottish Government, ran an editorial on the 6th of October reminding the Minister for Community Safety that she had welcomed the findings of the Morrow report and in response had stated that her government will change Scotland for the better and build sectarian, sectarianism free communities to be benefit all of our people. The editorial considered that, and I quote, it was bizarre that this report has not debated, been debated in Parliament. The paper's editorial asked, how is the work progressing? Are the outcomes being monitored? Is the spending appropriate? What happens when the funding runs out next year? Good questions. Many of us would be interested to learn the answers, and I hope the Minister may be able to answer them uh, today. The advisory group recognised that Scotland was at the start of a journey and called for political leadership. That indeed was its first recommendation, so it is disappointing that the Scottish Government to date seems to have been reluctant to show that leadership, certainly in Parliament. The Government's response to the advisory group's report appeared in some ways to abdicate its responsibility by pointing out that some of the recommendations did not relate directly to Government. Now that is not the point. We need to know if the Government is taking 
uh, matters forward, how, uh, and, and, and the, the, the ones which are applied to it. The Scottish Government's response states that the Government recognises the need for a broad and holistic approach. We would agree with that, and that also it has written to key organisations, inviting them to respond to the recommendations which apply to them, but, and that was by the end of June 2014. So, in a way, that makes it even more surprising that four months on from that deadline, the Scottish Parliament itself still has to discuss these recommendations. In the absence of the government being prepared to use its time to initiate debate in this important uh, report, Scottish Labour has offered some of our time to start the process. The report, uh, timing of the report, uh, oh, excuse me, I haven't got my glasses today. <laughs> difficult to yeah. the, the report highlighted some key aspects, I, I might need them, uh, of sectarian in to base Scotland. Firstly, that it varies significantly by geography, class, age, gender, occupation and community that the impact varies from community to community and is affected by historical religious antagonisms, class and political associations and commercial interests. And that the people involved are not necessarily still actively participating in a faith community, but have cultural affiliations which can lead to an us versus them mentality. And that sectarian is not just overtly aggressive bigotry or anti-Catholic or anti-Irish prejudice. In terms of addressing sectarianism, the report recommended, as I have already indicated, the importance of leadership at all levels. The advisory group did not consider that new legislation was required. Rather, existing legislation on human rights, equalities and hate crime should be applied. Members may recall that opposition members in Parliament made this very point when the offensive behaviour at football bill was being discussed. The group also recognised that further research was needed to learn more about sectarian attitudes, such as the role of gender and sectarian victimisation, the role of social media, the impact of potentially divisive events, such as parades uh, or indeed football matches, employment discrimination and other forms of tension within sections of the Christian faith. Crucially, the report found that organisations and institutions at all levels must take responsibility for sectarianism. And that, of course, includes this Parliament and the Scottish government, government taking a cross-party approach. Now, the Government amendment refers to scrutiny by the Equal Opportunities Committee. That was one session with Dr Morrow and Dr Rosie. There was no questioning of the Minister, no questioning of state, uh, stakeholders. So that is not scrutiny, nor indeed is the session in the Justice Committee about the bill or about the Act. This is actually about the, this report and the responses to the report. Mr Mason. John Mason. Hey, the, um, the committee did look at it and agreed because the working group was carrying on the advisory group that they would look at it again, which we're about to do, I think, before Christmas. And then, I mean, we didn't feel there was any point duplicating the work of the advisory group, but we want to kind of build on it. Would you accept that? Murray. That, that may, I, I indeed have seen the, the, the letter from the chair of, the, of, of that committee. My point, though, is not that necessarily, and I accept as a member of the Justice Committee, which could also look at it, that the committees have a, a, a very heavy workload. However, in the absence of what I am... Uh, but the point I am making is that the Parliament should be considering it, that Parliament should be discussing this. Given how important this was considered to be when that, that Act was being rushed through, why are we not actually considering this ourselves? Uh, I, am, I do thank the Minister for facilitating meetings with representatives from the advisory group, where myself and other party spokespeople, I found these meetings very useful. The Government states in its response that there has been a great deal of cross-party support for the need to tackle sectarianism, and it wants to build on this constructive and positive engagement. So do we. Dr Morrow has kindly offered to meet with members of the Scottish Labour uh, group of MSPs. I'm sure it has done with members of other parties. Uh, we'll be meeting at the beginning of ne next month. I know several of my colleagues are very keen to take up that opportunity. But a debate in Parliament is one of the mechanisms which we can use to highlight the issues and the actions which are being taken. It is not just the responsibility of politicians to undertake this, this leadership role. The Morrow Report also places responsibility on churches, local authorities, journalists, football clubs and community organisations. The report highlights the, the requirement for strategic financial support and that this needs to be provided for community activity and education uh, which could address sectarianism at a grassroots level. Uh, and uh, community-based projects uh, supported by the um, uh, Scottish Government since 2012 ought to be evaluated to determine what has actually been successful. Now, I know we will hear from the Government that it committed... No, no, uh, I must get on, I'm afraid. The Government committed £9 million over three years to research, education and community-based and policing initiatives aimed at addressing uh, sectarianism. Now, I hope that we will hear today from the Minister whether the evaluation that the advisory group is requ uh, requesting is actually underway. 
The Scottish Labour Party has consistently taken sectarianism very seriously. The Labour Liberal Democrat government created the offensive religiously aggravated breach of the peace uh, in the Criminal Justice Scotland Act of 2004 and funded nil by mouth and sense over sectarianism. Uh, and those of us who were here at the time will recall that Jack McConnell, as First Minister, personally championed a number of measures to address what he described as Scotland's secret shame. Uh, um, including uh, 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 such things as uh, promoting shared campuses and twinning between denominational and non-denominational -denom schools. Our motion also refers to the offensive behaviour at Football and Th Threatening Communications Act at 2012. Now, uh, all the opposition parties felt that this bill was unnecessary and unhelpful. Uh, and despite the broad remit of the advisory group's work, this bill was actually placed off limits by ministers and not therefore discussed at any point. And I see I have five seconds left. So in that time, uh, I, th I had a number of other points I would have liked to have made. However, I, I do, uh, would argue that the OBF Act is an inadequate knee-jerk reaction. I think many of us felt that. Uh, and I suspect possibly the government may actually feel that too. But despite that is no reason for this issue being kicked into the long grass uh, until after March 2015. We must discuss the wider issues around uh, the uh, education preventative measures that need to be taken to tackle sectarianism. And therefore, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move amendment number 11395.1. Ms Cunningham, seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I assure everyone in the chamber that this government remains completely committed to tackling sectarianism uh, and the uh, level of that commitment can be seen in the immense amount of work that's been undertaken uh, over the last three years. Uh, now, uh, Elaine Murray talked uh, at length about the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications act and that in our view, does have a clear role to play in meeting the commitment that was made. And there are welcome indications of success with decreases in offences of religious hatred and offending under the Act. It is working. But it is important to remember that the Act was brought in for a reason, to tackle offensive and abusive behaviour at and around football. And in recent days, we've been reminded about why the Act is needed through online abuse, including threats of violence and death sent to players and their families. And people do need to remember the extraordinarily heated atmosphere uh, in which this bill uh, uh, emerged. But we've never tried to claim that sectarianism is confined to football, which is why we have invested the record £9 million over three years to tackle this scourge through a range of activities. It has been the biggest commitment ever made to anti-sectarianism by any government in Scotland. And as we stated in the draft budget last month, I'm making a further commitment to invest over £3 million to support community-based initiatives to tackle sectarianism and further develop our understanding through research, while continuing, of course, to support work to tackle racial or ethnic hatred in 2015-16. Uh, so it's a pity that Elaine Murray clearly hadn't read that line in the draft budget. Now, when I came into this job, I had two very clear aims for this agenda. One was to make sure that the work that we were supporting was getting into communities and tackling the problems that they were experiencing at community level. And the second was to build a robust research and knowledge base on the nature and extent of sectarianism in modern Scotland so that future policy could be made uh, on the basis of evidence and not innuendo. And I remember being quite shocked uh, when I first came into this job to discover that there was virtually no information and evidence base at all available in Scotland. So we have spent some considerable time and money beginning to put that work into place to ensure that we do have the evidence uh, going forward. And that's why I've ensured that our work is a good example of what we're calling the Scottish approach informed by the Christie Commission, assets based and placing the needs of communities at the centre of the agenda. There are 44 community-based projects. They're bottom-up, not top-down. They're allowing us to get to the heart of the issue as it is experienced by communities with solutions emerging, being tailored to the specifically identified issues. At the same... Well, of course, Alima. Can you advise of those 44 uh, uh, funded projects, whether or not they will continue after March next year and whether any evaluation of their success has been undertaken? Well, of course that is happening, and no project has any uh, uh, right to assume that funding will continue simply without uh, 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 you know, having their work and outcomes assessed, and that is one of the things, one of the key jobs the advisory group is involved in doing. 
But at the same time as the projects are taking place, our comprehensive research program is helping us to build the most holistic evidence base on this issue that we've ever had. And the outcomes of all of this work have been developed in partnership with that independent advisory group uh, that we've discussed. But it's important to be clear that this is a new approach where time is needed to both allow the projects to deliver their initiatives and evaluate these and for research to be carried out and completed. There's a whole uh, slew of research currently uh, being undertaken or just uh, completed. There's a vast amount of work underway and there are timescales for delivery which will ensure the evidence we get back from them will be robust and informative. Now, I wholeheartedly welcomed uh, the wide-ranging report published by the advisory group on 13 December 2013, but the point that the member has missed out is that that was an interim report. It aimed its interim recommendations at organisations across Scottish public life, and yes, we did respond in February. At the same time, and in recognition of the far-reaching recommendations that had been made, I did write to all the key organisations, including football clubs and authorities, Police Scotland, Cosland, religious leaders, highlighting the recommendations which they needed to give consideration to uh, and address. And a number of their recommendations, the advisory group's recommendations, called for the development of a full research programme. The baseline for our research has been the Scottish Government's literature review and examination of the evidence on sectarianism in Scotland, published in 2013. Since then, we've built on the advisory group's recommendations by publishing information from the 2013 Scottish Crime and Justice Survey and Scottish Household Survey, stats on hate crime statistics, including religious hate crime from 2013-14, information relating to religion on demographics, population households, and health from the 2011 census, and that will all be supplemented next year with the completion and publication of research looking at the community impact of public processions, a Scottish social attitude survey model on sectarianism, a study of community experiences of sectarianism in Scotland, and information relating to religion on labour market, education, housing and transport from the 2011 census. But of course, academic research in itself doesn't tell the whole story. And that's why, as I've already said, we've accepted the advisory group's recommendation to use funded projects as data sources to ensure that the real experiences of those working in communities can be reflected when we pull all of this information together. And that, I'm afraid, takes time. I don't believe that anyone is under any illusions that there are quick fixes here and we need to allow all of the pieces of work to complete before we can bring them all together next year. I know that the advisory group don't want their report to become a political football, so I was therefore very encouraged when Dr Morrow confirmed that he'd been meeting with spokespeople from all political parties and the Equal Opportunities Committee to discuss uh, this agenda. And I fully recognise that there has consistently been a great deal of cross-party support for this agenda. And as recommended by the advisory group, I would like to explore the potential for building on this in the future. We are and always have been committed to tackling sectarianism and recognise that this is an issue where we need to work together. Our work with the advisory group continues and I look forward to their final report, which I'm sure will help us all to move this agenda forward. Thank you. Just for clarity, can you move the amendment? Sorry. I move okay. the amendment. I now call Margaret Mitchell. Ms Mitchell, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate Labour for allocating its parliamentary time to debate this important issue. Expressions of religious hatred, regardless of how they are articulated, are completely unacceptable in any civilised society. So it is deeply depressing that in Scotland today, sectarian divisions continue in some local communities. This frequently manifests itself as so-called sectarian banter or as terms of abuse, intimidation and harassment, which can, at the extreme end of the spectrum, develop into violence. As recently as April this year, sectarian tensions once again emerged at the Glasgow Cup final between the Selkirk and Rangers under-17 youth teams. This should have provided an opportunity, first and foremost, for these young players to display their skills 
and for this to be the story which dominated the headlines the next day. Instead, the occasion was virtually hijacked by supporters of both teams who taunted and derided each other with derogatory comments and songs for the duration of the match. So it's little wonder campaigners such as Nil By Mouth argue that not enough is being done by the Scottish Government and the football authorities to combat sectarianism. However, in seeking to tackle the problem, it is vitally important that the focus does not become narrowly restricted to football alone, but rather seeks to adopt a holistic and consensus-driven approach. Nor is it desirable or possible to arrest our way out of this problem, which seems to be the intent behind the deeply flawed Offensive Behaviour and Threatening Communications Act 2012. This is fundamentally bad legislation which was poorly drafted, constituting as it did a knee-jerk response to the something must be done clamour. The Act paved the way um, for the introduction of new criminal offences by statutory instrument without full and detailed parliamentary scrutiny and despite a distinct lack of consensus among key stakeholders. Very briefly. Do I, miss? Uh, I thank the member for giving way. I just wondered if she would feel that legislation uh, was part of the answer or can be part of the answer if it's purely got to be education. Margaret Mitchell. Precise point now. In 2011, it was then railroaded through by the SNP majority government in the face of opposition from Scottish Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats all voted against it. Nor were these opposition parties alone in their criticism of the 2012 Act. In 2013, Sheriff Richard Davidson said the Act was horribly drafted and that somehow the word mince comes to mind. Furthermore, his voice is only one amongst the legal profession who have spoken out against it. Where clarity is sought, the Act introduces vague catch-all offences, which some argue are very much at odds with civil liberties. In other words, the SNP response at that time to this deeply complex issue has been to introduce legislation which has only served to create con uh, confusion. And to answer Ms. Mr Mason's point, consequently, it should be repealed now, and uh, in view of the fact that existing law which do not, um, laws which do not vilify certain sections of society could easily be used to greater effect. And it is for this reason the Scottish Conservatives will be voting for the motion and against the amendment this evening. Self-evidently, this legislation, which was SNP's top-down response, isn't the answer to the problem. If Scotland's sectarianism is to be eliminated, then the root causes must be tackled. The moral report confirms the uh, inherent complexities of sectarianism where it exists in Scotland. It also stresses that the impact of sectarianism varies from community to community, and it's not a one-size-fits-all issue. In particular, the report highlights the importance of community-led activity um, as the way to overcome sectarianism. I very much welcome this approach, having been fortunate enough to see firsthand how such activity can make a transformative difference in the lives of young pe people when I visited the Mackin Trust project in Lark Hall. The project, which seeks to tackle sectarianism, ran successfully, bringing children and young adults of all religions and none together to participate in collaborative activities. Furthermore, Youth Link Scotland has seen proven success by addressing this issue through youth work with its action on sectarianism web portal. Here these initiatives endeavour to work with a local community where sectarian issues exist in, in order to educate, educate rather than punish. So, presiding officer, as such, this is surely an example of the best way to overcome the sectarian divide. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. Uh, four minute speeches, please. And time's fairly tight. Christian Allard, followed by John Pentland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we can all agree that we have a problem and we need, we need to talk about it. The key in this debate, in or outside the Chamber, is that this issue of sectarianism has to stop being aired through a megaphone that it needs to be talked about. It would be great if there were a scapegoat, or if we could find somebody who is responsible for the present level of sectarianism in Scotland, because that would mean we could get rid of the problem in an instant. Let's be clear, 
It's not going to work like that. It never does. We can all agree that this is about, it's more about than legislation only. It, we need uh, some kind of cultural change, a cultural change that, can, that could be led from this parliament. And it's important to realize that we all have uh, in this parliament responsibility when it comes to the tone we are, we, we are using when talking about, talking about sectarianism. This motion from Ellen Murray makes two important points that I would like to address. It first talks about the failure of our committees to address the report published by the advisory group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland. Then this motion from the Labour Party asks us to repeal the offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Commission Act 2012. Presenting officer, let me deal with the second part of the motion first. I cannot be the scapegoat of the Labour Party today. I was not yet a member uh, when the bill came to Parliament. What I can say as a member of the Justice Committee is that I was aware of Section 11 of the Bill that states that the Scottish Ministers are required to report to Parliament. The Minister today repeated that, we, that what we already knew, uh, the member of the Justice Committee are aware that the report will cover two full football seasons and that the evolution, repo evolution report will be laid before Parliament within 12 months at the end of the last football season. The members of the Committee heard that the Minister had already ruled out an early review of the Act in March this year, and Christine Graham, I will convince you to be right, we were all there when it happened, and nothing has changed since. Presenting officer, I happen to be a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee as well, as a member of the Justice Committee. Regarding the first part of this motion from Ellen Murray about a failure of our committee system to address the report published by the adversary group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland. Let me read you, first of all, the following letter dated on the 1st of April this year from our convener, Margaret Macherock, uh, to Dr. Monroe. And this letter is quite important because it says exactly what our uh, committee is going to do. Dear Mr. Monroe, thank you again for your attendance with Dr. Rosie at the 20th February meeting, following the Scottish Government's response to your initial funding and given the extension of the life of the advocacy group, we have agreed to wait further findings before taking a decision on carrying out more in-depth work. And this is important. Yes? The, the my point of information, uh, Mr. Allard, is that my motion does not comment on the failure of any committee. It comments on the fact that Parliament hasn't discussed the report. That's the important point. Question Allard? It did say committee on the motion. It does say committee. So I, maybe, maybe the motion is not drafted properly, and then maybe you will welcome the, the input of the Scottish Government and the, and, and the amendment. Uh, here we are, uh, presenting officer, no failure from our convener, but a proper, appropriate and uh, cross-party approach to help tackling sectarianism in Scotland. Uh, I remember that in taking evidence and to answer a question from uh, Shavan McMahon on February the 20th, Dr. Monroe stated, as we have already said, the issue cannot be addressed as a, politi a party political issue. If it is addressed in that way, as he knows from his own experience, it becomes extremely difficult to have a serious conversation about it. We need a cultural change, one that can be led from this government and this parliament and from the tone of our debates in the chamber and that committee. Mr. Thank Allard, you. thank you. Your speech. Oh, sorry, was it four minutes? Are you... You have finished your speech. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, President. John Pentland, followed by Christine President officer, the, uh, the forthcoming oath firm March has attracted the attention of the media, even though it's three months away. And while it's nearly three years since the last, since the last met, there is an understandable excitement. Supporters hope that Scottish football will get the much needed competitive boost and that, there is, uh, and that there will be a greater maturity among the small sections who are an embarrassment to their clubs and who project an image that should no longer have any place in Scotland. And there is, of course, a widespread feeling that the offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act exacerbates that problem and it should be repealed. But when we talk about challenging sectarianism, the old firm and other sporting manif manifestations are only part of that story. And in many ways, they are subsidiary to the wider task of challenging sectarianism in society through prevention and education. And it is that wider task that we need to speak to about today. 
Tackling sectarianism has and will continue to be a priority for the Scottish Labour Party. And in power, we had, the, we had an action plan and actively pursued an education strategy designed to tackle it. By contrast, the SNP government pushed through a controversial law despite widespread opposition and doubts about its effectiveness uh, that had been borne out by the subsequent events. The SNP also set up an advisory group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland, but through Dr Morrow's report, which was published over a year ago, it still awaits proper consideration and debate. The supposedly concerned Scottish Government has published a, a response, but significantly that response fails to take on board the recommendations about actions, which is a responsibility. The Morrow report specifically called on the Scottish Government to use powers to engage people in discussion of sectarianism and to ensure that instances of, of sectarianism are recognised as such. It said that the Scottish Government should provide financial support for community activity and an education that, that can address sectarianism at grassroots level, with the issue being part of public funding for community work, education and youth work. Yet, community projects that have been set up still don't know what will happen when their funding comes to an end next year. Other recommendations included the evaluation of the existing community-based projects to see what works and encouraging schools to create anti-sectarianism partnerships. Dr Morrow claimed many senior and influential people across Scotland have failed to show the leadership needed to confront the problem. He is rightly concerned that his reports... I'm sorry, members, in his last 25 seconds... He is rightly concerned that his reports, recommendations for actions, are not being imp implemented. So the question is, are the ministers opposed to either action to tackle sectarianism, or have they just been too busy securing a no vote to separation while allowing Dr Morris' report to gather dust? Either way, President Officer, that is shameful. These recommendations deserve better attention from the Scottish Government. And facing up to sectarianism and giving it the attention it deserves is long overdue. Scottish Labour will do that, and in looking to become the next Scottish Government, we promise a renewed focus and effective active on sectarianism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pentland. Christy Graham, followed by Alice McInnes. Uh, presiding officer, what an utterly depressing speech from John Pentland, when the thrust of the report is that we should not politicise sectarianism. There is nobody in this chamber who supports sectarianism. But to speak in such a manner lays any hope of a broad church discussing this in the Parliament in a grown-up and mature way almost to rest, albeit temporarily. And I would say to Lane Murray, her motion, the thrust of her motion is the repeal of an Act of Parliament. She is the one who focuses on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications Act. Otherwise, it would not have been raised by other members, such as Margaret Mitchell. And it's tagged on to the motion as if it's part of this report, which it is not. The member herself admits that the report says in the executive summary at paragraph 21, we have not addressed any issues specifically relating to the offensive behaviour of football and threatening communications, Scotland Act 2012, we are aware that a review of the Act is to be undertaken at the end of this football season and a report submitted to Parliament. And can I say, let me go through uh, some points first. I have to say the committee did have the opportunity, I'm going to deal with that part first, as the member is well aware, at its meeting on the 4th of March. And at the 4th of March, the member asked two questions and she was apparently satisfied with the answers because I always allow members to ask additional questions. And I'm looking at the minutes of the meeting of that particular uh, uh, 4th of March meeting because there was a decision taken
taken in private in relation to the evidence we'd heard and the correspondence. And the minutes are public, and the minutes actually said, the committee consider next steps in private during a work programme discussion later on the same day. The minutes of the meeting show the decision was to consider the next research document on charges reported under the Act once published in June 2014. This research was circulated to members when published in June. No member requested any further action from the committee on this. So it's a bit rich to come to, the, to, to this chamber and say, remember, this is a committee parliament. We are the parliament as well. You have in your motion a reference to committee saying, we have not looked at this in depth. The member had an opportunity to bring this up in discussions and work programme and has not done it. So I really look at why are we doing this today? I can't think of a good reason to debate this. There's a good reason to talk about the report. But the way to talk about a report like this is to have a debate without motion, to have the parliament allow, which we've done before, to allow a very, very sensitive issue, very complex, very diverse, to be discussed across the chamber in a responsible fashion, not bringing in party political points, right, left and centre, which do no favours, to people confronting sectarianism in all its forms, whether on football pitches, in the streets, in work, wherever. This does no service to this parliament. And it makes me so angry that the Labour Party, that I used to have some regard for, frankly, has lost, I've lost all regard for it now, because you look for cheap party political tricks on the back of anything you can find. This is a great shame, because also in this report, it makes plain that there is a need for leadership on this very difficult issue. You're not showing that today. You're not showing any little whisk of that today. Instead, I think what we're looking at is diversionary tactics from a party that doesn't know which way to look, that's in a busy and an internal argument, and looking for something else to hit the front page of the Daily Record. Thank you, Alice McKinnis, followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And Scottish Liberal Dem Democrats do welcome the opportunity to highlight the work of the advisory group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland. Scotland has wrestled with sectarianism for far too long. And debate too often has been suppressed or sensationalised, reduced to simplistic understandings and stereotypes. But through its report of December 2013, the group's initial contribution moved matters forward significantly. I have met Dr Morrow and his team regularly since the group was established in 2012. Upon his appointment, Dr Morrow said, and I quote, the advisory group will work hard to ensure that our advice is rooted in real evidence and practical experience. These expectations have been realised and I've been greatly impressed by their measured and thoughtful approach over the last two years. The group has given people a voice, opportunities to speak about their experiences frankly and maturely, and it has had considerable success in engaging parties across Civic Scotland in awkward conversations that some would rather avoid. In considering personal, organisational and community responsibility, it has challenged them to confront issues frequently but wrongly deemed irrelevant or simply too difficult. Its report examined the complexities and nuances of sectarianism and crucially established the foundations for change through initiatives focused on prevention, building trust and understanding. Local authorities, churches, football clubs, schools, the media and community organisations and more were presented with practical solutions. Grassroots solutions focused on prevention, building trust and understanding. Solutions that will foster a long overdue culture of leadership and partnership working. For example, it identified local authorities as agents of social change, which must embrace sectarianism with the conviction and confidence with which they have approached other equality issues. Sectarianism is linked to so many other social challenges with which local authorities are involved. It impacts on community cohesion, safety, diversity and well-being. And I have to say I'm therefore surprised that so few local authorities have hardwired consideration of the problem into their planning processes. And there has been a broad failure to establish a whole council approach. I do hope that COSLA and councillors have taken on board the group's recommendations and that the stark divergence in council efforts across the country will be eradicated. Attitudes towards equality issues, including racism and homophobia, have been transformed in recent decades. 
Sectarianism and the marginalisation and resentment that it causes must be deemed just as shameful. But this will take time. The identification of progress points for each of the organisations and institutions mentioned in the report would assist in recognising improvements as the body of evidence grows. Presiding officer, Scottish Liberal Democrats opposed the SNP's offensive behaviour at football emergency legislation, the only party to do so throughout its rust passage through Parliament. It was a flawed, headline-grabbing response that I felt ignored the overwhelming concerns of Civic Scotland, and I think it still risks doing more harm than good. But it is important to recognise the advisory group is engaged in a much broader discussion about how best to bring communities and key stakeholders together. It presents a much wider range of interventions than those possible or established through legislation. Of course, the 2012 Act should be monitored and its effectiveness thoroughly evaluated, but Labour's decision to inherently connect the two in its motion is neither appropriate nor helpful, and it is for that reason that we will support the Government's amendment tonight. As the report notes, we are just at the beginning of the journey to eradicate sectarianism in Scotland. I therefore commend the Scottish Government's commitment to the advisory group and look forward to further substantial impartial expert advice. Thank you. Sandra White, followed by Mike McMahon. Thank you very much, President Officer, and can I just thank Alice McInnes for her contribution. Uh, very thought, thoughtful, and I think it got to the absolute nub of what is happening, and thank you uh, very much for that, uh, Alice McInnes. Uh, presiding officer, I, I have to repeat uh, what Christine Graham had mentioned about the, the actual motion and what it looks at. I think if we all look at that, we look at the title of the motion is Tackling Sectarianism. And yet all we heard, all we heard from the Labour benches was the Offences of Behaviour Act and the repeal of repeal of that act. Nothing at all, nothing at all in regard to the work that's been carried out in communities. And you know, I, I find it deeply I find it deeply worrying that the Labour Heart Party is concentrated on that part, on that part of the motion and not about the work being carried out in the communities. John Pentland touched on this wee bit, but I think I might repeat it for the sake of the Labour Party and others. Perhaps it has something to do with a report that was put forward by the Daily Record, which says that Labour pledged to scrap the Act if elected in 2016. I'll leave that with you. But I, don't want to, I don't want to continue on that theme. I think there's much more to the legislation which should be looked at also. And I want to concentrate on the good, very, very good work that's been carried out in the communities it was mentioned, I think, by Margaret Mitchell at one point, and it was also mentioned by Alice McKinsey, and it's funded and provided by the Scottish Government. I've only got a small list. I wouldn't be able to have time to read the full list out. I've picked out the ones which are in my constituency and other parts that's near the constituency. Glasgow Women's Library, Women's Experience, Exploring Sectarianism as It Affects Women. Very, very big issue when you look at domestic violence. £143,928. In Cahoots Parents Network, anti sectarian workshops for parents, £69,530 in that particular area. Sense over sectarianism, looking at education and community engagement, that's in Greater Glasgow, £387,597. Other one is Cambridge University Technical Services Limited, provide the services for this. I see life skills for a changing Scotland. Glasgow, Falkirk, Edinburgh, Stirling and Inverclyde. £100,000 to there. The Conferee Anti-Sectarianism Project, £178,070. In encouraging community dialogue against sectarianism, working on relationships within the churches and in the communities also. Surely that's what we should be looking at. That's the way to tackle the issue of sectarianism. In gender, women's experience through art and dialogue, and that again tackles sectarianism through women's experience. And I raise the issue again. They have, I'm sorry, Members John, I don't have time. Minute. 
We, we've, we've seen the issues when there's football matches on. You're talking about women have got to be looked at in that particular field, about the domestic violence issues. Now, the community engagement one, £98,170, and that's through in gender. There's lots, lots more. You want to have a look at them in your own constituencies and throughout Scotland, not just in my area of Glasgow. That's where we're going to tackle the problems of sectarianism. There is a way, as John Mason has said, for legislation and education. The two are not mutually exclusive. And I welcome the amendment in the, cabs, well, the minister's name because I really, the motion put forward by the Labour Party actually does not tackle anything George, but perhaps please. their own inadequacies. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Now call on Michael McMahon to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Up to four minutes, please, Michael. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. As you know, uh, a few weeks ago, we had uh, the great privilege of taking part in a visit to the Commonwealth graves in Ypres Salient in Flanders as part of the World War I commemoration event organised by the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly. BIPA, for those who don't know, is a body of parliamentarians from all of the jurisdictions in the British Isles with the aim of developing and progressing the peace process in Ireland. As well as visiting the Scottish and Welsh war memorials, uh, a number of uh, cemeteries, and also the famous Menin Gate. For me, the most poignant event was the visit to the Island of Ireland Peace Park in Mazine, which was the place chosen by the Irish Government to permanently remember those from all parts of Ireland who gave their lives in the so called Great War. As part of the ceremony at that day, the peace pledge which adorns a plinth in the park was read out. That pledge states, we repudiate and denounce violence, aggression, intimidation, threats and unfriendly behaviour. It proclaims that, as Protestants and Catholics, we apologise for the terrible deeds we have done to each other and ask for forgiveness. And it goes on to implore all people to help build a peaceful and tolerant society and to remember the solidarity and trust that developed between Protestant and Catholic soldiers when they served together in these trenches. Now, as I stood in that, what is a now tranquil place that once resounded to gunfire and bombs, I could not help but think that while this memorial was specific to Irish soldiers, its sentiments could equally reflect the situation in Scotland and that such words are as relevant here as they are on our neighbouring island. So how regrettable it is that I find that where the Irish look to achieve respect and reconciliation, through their high-minded ambition. We, unfortunately, in this place, have had to deal with the knee-jerk legislation in the shape of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, which undermines the very prospect of such an objective being achieved in Scotland. On the contrary, that legislation has metaphorically driven people into the trenches, and Scotland has had to deal with that hatred. Three years on from the introduction of that most illiberal, divisive and retrograde legislation that was ever brought before this Parliament, this Government has introduced it in the face of almost unanimous opposition and still refuses to concede that it got it wrong. Even after its own advisory group produced such a positive and progressive blueprint for the development of anti-sectarian policies in Scotland, the Scottish Government still cannot bring itself to even debate adequately this subject in this chamber. It is three years on. The reason why we are holding this debate today, it is three years on today when we passed the legislation on the Offensive Behaviour Act. So when Christine Graham says we are just using this as an excuse, this is a commemoration as well. This is reminding people that this uh, Government in spite of the unanimous cross-party opposition, did indeed polarise this Parliament and did play politics with this issue. So we won't take any lectures from them about bringing debates here today. The, the Morrow Report is undoubtedly one of the most important documents ever produced in relation to sectarianism, and the Scottish Government is to be commended for initiating it. However, where is the leadership that that report called for? What a pity it is that the Scottish Government abdicates responsibility for taking forward the Morrow Report's recommendation and shies away from confronting the problem. It is vital now that the Scottish Government starts to show 
that it recognises that sectarianism is not, as the advisory group points out, the same as anti-Catholicism or anti-Irishness. Instead, the Scottish Government still shows no sign that it appreciates or understands that its attitude to sectarianism close, is please. itself part of the problem. Thank you very much. I now call on Roderick Campbell, after which we will move to closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we all know, regrettably, the scourge of sectarianism remains with us. But I, for one, certainly welcome the thoughtful contribution made by the advisory group last year. From that, I note their conclusion in section 6.1 that sectarianism continues to be an active element in Scottish life, coupled, however, with their acknowledgement that many participants in the study concluded that the immediate impact of it had lessened considerably and measurably, measurably over the past decades. Indeed, Duncan Morrow, when he gave evidence to the Equal Opportunities Committee on the 20th of February this year, said, we wanted to find some more effective ways of dealing with what is probably a long-term question rather than an acute one in Scotland. I agree with that conclusion. Indeed, economic discrimination may have lessened, and we are fortunate as a society that we now have legislation to protect human rights, to deal with discrimination, to address inequality and criminalise hate crime. Such that I very much agree with the Working Party's conclusion that additional legislation is not needed at this time. I also agree with their view that there are no quick fixes or easy answers to sectarianism. And of course, the point that at the present time the vast majority of funding to tackle sectarianism comes from public funds is well made. Whilst I acknowledge the substantial contribution made by organisations such as Nil by Mouth, I think we should all recognise that much more could be done by organisations in the private sector, such as football clubs and football associations, who do need to lead by example. While struggles for control of boards go on, and indeed some football clubs struggle for their very financial existence, I think it would be all too easy to overlook the important role that football has in eradicating sectarianism. Taking a lead in opposing sectarian behaviour remains a key, and in particular recognising that what some people call banter has no place in modern Scotland. In my view, traditions should only be encouraged where they have value. But there are positives. Despite funding cuts from Westminster, the Scottish Government will be investing three million, and indeed till March 2015, in tackling this problem. I welcome that. I also appreciate that funding needs to be concentrated where it can be most effective recognising that sectarianism can be very localised, whilst also recognising the benefits of a Scotland-wide approach like the YouthLink Scotland Action on Sectarianism web portal, as we have already heard today in, from the Minister. Changing young people's attitudes must be a priority for the future, and it's clearly important for Education Scotland to ensure that any work on anti-sectarianism is being taken forward in line with the Curriculum for Excellence. Getting it right for every child is crucial. And I also welcome attempts to promote equality in the classroom, to build good citizens for the future, helping to break the self-perpetuating nature of sectarianism. I also welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to gathering evidence to build for the future. And I listened carefully to the Minister's comments in her opening remarks on that. We definitely need more information on communities' experience and attitudes. And I don't know what impact analysis of the demography of the 2011 census will reveal, but I await that with interest. And what about marches and parades? Yeah. Do they cause fear, alarm, public disorder, or are they simply families enjoying a day out, as some suggest? At a meeting of the Justice Committee on the 4th of March, to which we referred earlier on, I inquired what the position was in relation to research being conducted by Stirling University to the effects of parades and marches. The government official at the time said that a report was expected by summer 2014. I've not been able to access this report. I don't know if the Minister has any update on that uh, in her closing remarks. Finally, presiding officer, in relation to the question of the, the Act, the Offensive Behaviour Act, we are now three months after the review period ended. We're approximately nine months before August 15, the deadline to lay a report before Parliament. I, like others, await the evaluation report with interest, but I don't want to prejudge it. I don't know what the comments would be, and with respect to the Labour Party and indeed to the Conservatives, just let's wait and see. It's not long grass, it's careful consideration. And, well, maybe this report will be laid before Parliament earlier, let's hope so. But whilst I accept that the Act has become a party political football, just remind ourselves again Must what close, Dr please. Morrow said, that sectarianism cannot be addressed as a party political issue. Please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Now I call on Margaret Fraser, four minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I do have one point of agreement uh, with uh, Christine Graham. 
And that is, I think there is a, a tension at the heart of the Labour motion this afternoon. On the one hand, calling for more action from the Scottish Government to tackle sectarianism and implement the Morrow Report, but on the other hand, calling for a repeal of the measure brought forward, the Offensive Behaviour uh, at Football Act. On the broader issue of sectarianism, I've always objected to the way some politicians have sought to portray this as Scotland's shame. Maybe it's always just been a part of my life experience growing up on the east coast of Scotland, but I do not share the view that sectarianism is endemic across the whole of Scottish society. And many people I know resent us all being tarred with the same brush. Now that is not to say that sectarianism is not a problem in some communities in Scotland or in some situations. But it is the problem of a small minority, and we should stop damning the great majority by association. And any measure to tackle sectarianism should therefore be targeted and proportionate. And that brings me on to the Offensive Behaviour in Football and Threatening Communications Scotland Act 2012. If ever there were an illiberal, unnecessary and nonsensical piece of legislation, this was it. And throughout the passage of the bill, the Scottish Conservatives opposed it and our view has not changed. And, and in that respect, I'm happy to agree with the wording of the Labour motion calling for its repeal. It is both illiberal and unworkable. It is illiberal because it criminalises, in essence, people's opinions. Now, as it happens, I believe that, in general, people should be nicer to each other. People should not say things to each other that cause offence. But that does not mean that people who break these rules should necessarily be criminalised. Religiously motivated discrimination should be against the law. But it is not the business of government to criminalise private thoughts or prejudices. In the words of Queen Elizabeth I, we should not make windows into men's souls. So it is simply nonsense to prosecute people just for singing songs that other people might find offensive, particularly when the reasonableness of that offence need not necessarily be in question. And we end up in a ludicrous situation where people sitting in their homes watching a football match on television and hearing songs being sung by the fans in a stadium where they are nowhere near then telephone the police to make a complaint that they have been offended and that falls under this Act. But if this Act were simply illiberal, it would not be that different from lots of other Acts that have been passed by this Parliament. Its foolishness is compounded by the fact that it is also confused. When the bill was going through Parliament, my colleague John Lamont questioned the Minister as to whether singing our national anthem, God Save the Queen, could be an offence to which she had to reply that would depend on the circumstances. And she went on to say that a fan of Celtic Football Club making the sign of the cross could also be deemed to be offensive uh, and fall under the ambit of this Act, depending on the circumstances. Now, it seems to me it's a basic principle of law that it should be certain so that those who might be at risk of breaking it are aware in advance of the consequences of their actions. This legislation fails that basic test. Last year, the High Court of Justiciary considered the case of Joseph Cairns, a Celtic fan who had attended a match against Ross County in Dingwall, and was filmed by police officers singing two Celtic songs, neither of which I have any direct familiarity, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I believe they were the role of honour and the boys of the old brigade. This led him to being prosecuted under the Act. But this was a victimless crime. No one was offended by this man's singing. No one was incited to public disorder. And Mr Cairns was one of several thousand other Celtic fans also singing these songs, and yet he was singled out for attention. On oh, no please. definition of the term is this justice. Presiding officer, in a modern, free, liberal and democratic society, we should not be criminalising speech or opinions, and this Parliament should not be passing confused legislation. This is a bad law, and it should be repealed. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Rosanna Cunningham, Minister of Six Minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I do welcome the contributions that members have made to this uh, debate, though I'm surprised not to have heard more positive suggestions uh, uh, of other work which could be done. And I do want to reiterate here that we will listen to any good suggestions from wherever they emanate. It's just a shame that we've not really been hearing anything of that. Now, I said at the outset that the Scottish Government has been and continues to be fully committed to tackling sectarianism. Depressingly, however, a number of members this afternoon, and that includes Margaret Mitchell and we've just heard from Murda Fraser, seem to want to rerun the debate that we had on the Offensive Behaviour Bill. 
Now, the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act was brought forward for a reason, to tackle sectarian and other unacceptable behaviour uh, around football and address unacceptable religious and other threats, whether posted on the internet or sent through the post. And it did not come out of a vacuum. Some members, Margaret Mitchell, for example, call for the bill's immediate repeal. Really? Would that be despite the fact that the Act is currently being reviewed, following the correct parliamentary process, and that that review is in its final stages? What a bizarre suggestion. We should not be preempting the findings of that review. Margaret Mitchell. Doesn't she accept and realise it's an unwelcome distraction taking up resources when existing law would do the job so much better and we could focus on community based statistics actually suggest that it's working and I would suggest no. the member wait until the review is completed before coming to a conclusion. And as this debate has demonstrated, however, it's utterly wrong to see that act as the start, middle and end of the work that this government has done to tackle the issue. I need to re-emphasise there has been a record £9 million investment over the last three years and further £3 million in the 2015-16 financial year doing exactly what many members called for, such as John Pentland, who clearly doesn't listen to a single word I said in my opening remarks. It has allowed us to take a radical new approach to tackling this issue, one which is starting to make the progress that we all want to see. Our 44 community-based projects continue to get underneath the issue in communities across Scotland and tailor solutions to specifically meet the needs identified. The research programme is helping us to build the most holistic understanding of the nature and extent of sectarianism in modern Scotland that we have ever had. And the close and very positive working relationship that we and a number of you in this chamber had with the advisory group on tackling sectarianism in Scotland is testament to the fact that by working together we can most effectively address sectarianism. And I'm grateful to Alison McInnes for discussing that particular aspect in some detail. This need to work together seems to have bypassed a number of members in this chamber. But the most important point that I want to emphasise is that the work that we've been delivering over the last three years has been specifically designed to take us from a position of having very poor quality data, information and evidence on the nature and extent of sectarianism in modern Scotland to one where we are able to make informed policy decisions based on expert advice and comprehensive evidence. And that's why we've commissioned a wide range of academic research and will bring this together with real lived experiences through evidence gathering from the funded projects and through specific initiatives like the one being delivered by the Scottish Storytelling Centre, which will allow the voices of those who experience the everyday reality of sectarianism to be heard. And I've got some depressing news for Murdo Fraser. This isn't only confined to Glasgow and oh, West oh, Central oh. Scotland. We've set ourselves on a path to achieving the best and most robust evidence base on sectarianism in modern Scotland that we have ever had, and we will deliver this. The final report of the advisory group will play a central role in focusing our future approach to tackling sectarianism and continuing to build our evidence base. And we've worked with the advisory group and the Voluntary Action Fund, that's the grant managers for this area of work, on the development and delivery of an effective evaluation tool which will allow us to robustly assess the impact of these projects to ensure that future decisions are informed by the evidence gathered and funding is focused on areas where it will have the greatest impact. Dr. Richard Simpson. Wait, Minister, we all welcome the projects. Can I say that when I was uh, in your position as Minister, one of my concerns was that we did not make decisions quickly enough to allow and prevent redundancy notices going out on successful projects. Could I urge you to make sure that the decisions are reached in December rather than January when redundancy notices will have gone out to excellent projects which we all support? I am very conscious of the pressures on all uh, voluntary sector organisations when it comes to rolling over government funding. The uh, member may be aware that we are not able to do it for the next three years. We have only got one year of funding coming up, which is a challenge. The impact and assessment of all projects is continuing to March 2015. All information that is collected will help us build on the current evidence base of sectarianism in Scotland. But the project work will also begin to highlight the interventions that do and in some cases don't work for communities to tackle sectarianism as they experience it. And I, for one, am excited by the positive direction of this agenda and the fact that by working together we really can tackle sectarianism once and for all. 2015 brings us 
two huge pieces of work on this issue. The final report of the advisory group on tackling sectarianism and the review that was uh, provided for within the offensive behaviour legislation. That's two enormous pieces of work for us to deal with next year. Believe you me, we will deal with this next year. Many thanks. <clears throat> I now call on Graham Pearson to wind up the debate. Eight minutes, please, Mr Pearson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Murdo Fraser mentioned earlier that he rejected the notion of a secret or hidden shame across Scotland. And it's in that context that Scottish Labour will continue to bring this subject matter to the Chamber and to the committees of this Parliament, because for far too long it has been a hidden and secret shame that has affected the lives of people across Scotland. Secondly, I, I would indicate to Sandra White that she either misheard the contribution from Elaine Murray eh, or misrepresented elements of it, because on this side of the chamber, we acknowledge the hard work being done by those who would contribute to partnership working and influence the very cultures that affect eh, our country. Today's debate for all its fine words and good intentions, has demonstrated clearly that Scotland has a problem at the very heart of many of our communities. The Government, by its legislation, characterised sectarianism as a problem largely related to football and encouraged by a few groups. This Government has a perpetuated a view that sectarianism is a scourge, particularly in the west of Scotland, and fuelled by and fueled, and fueled by working class men. And evidence of that comes from the front bench of, of the Conservative Party only this afternoon. That misunderstanding of a situation is something that needs to be met head on. Little acknowledgement is made of those who exercise sectarian influences in employment, in the conduct of day to day commerce, in our places of education our social clubs and pubs, and in the very housing estates within which our children are brought up, not to mention the foul expressions some will hear emanating from the expensive seats and hospitality boxes across the countries on match days. In that failing, the Minister's flawed understanding of the initial uh, issues that we grapple to deal with knee jerked with the declaration of that match of shame where fewer arrests in a, a crowd of many thousands of, of fans occurred, but it was followed by a summit meeting and a rush to legislate to provide this nation with an ultimate response. It did not meet the mark. In, in the faces of pleas from inside this parliament and from communities three years ago, we wanted to address the wider issues of uh, research, of education engagement, engagement with the voluntary sectors and churches, with football supporters, to deal with the source of sectarianism, a hatred for our fellow citizens. The very elements referred to in the advisory group report, a report that we welcome and give great energy and support to. A minority of Scots have developed a particular passion to hate, whether that be on the grounds of gender, colour, race, sexual orientation, disability, physical or mental, and even now in our political lives, we have developed a commentary enabling concepts of unionism and nationalism to attract pejorative values. We endure members of our community who indulge their ability to target, to despise, to abuse their fellow human beings, but all means open to them through violence, utterances, texts, emails, social media and indeed through the media itself. As a result, we now have uniformed police and a national unit bearing the emblem anti-sectarian initiative on their tabards. What must the wider world think of us when they view us in world football? The failure at the heart of the government lies in the fact. I am happy to give way. I thank the, the member for giving way. Um, I would be really interested in mentioning football on a number of occasions. Perhaps he would give us your, his view on the fines handed down to clubs for their fans by UEFA, handing down fines to clubs for offensive uh, songs. 
uh, what they consider to be offensive songs. Mr Pearson. Uh, I will come on to indicate that I would welcome all football authorities to take direct responsibility for the behaviour of their fans within, within that environment. But uh, as I would uh, recognise, the failure at the heart of the government lies in the fact that they sought to legislate and criminalise without taking the difficult decisions, the steps suggested by their very own advisory group members, steps that could have been actively pursued in the three years that have gone past. Ministers need to be honest about the scale of the task ahead, and the Minister has acknowledged that to some extent this afternoon. Uh, to engage with opposition parties, anti-sectarian charities, educators, wider civ civic Scotland dealing with hate crime more generally, and work together to take forward and leave this prejudice behind. The moral report properly identifies leadership and research as major elements for future strategies. So I would invite the Minister to ensure that this government does provide visible leadership, a focus on sectarianism on a month-by-month -month basis to ensure uh, I'll take your intervention. Fiona McLeod. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit per perplexed with where the member is going with this because when you talk about leadership, the minister was clear, you know, over £9 million for 44 projects. Just last week, I hosted a reception for the Mark Scott Leadership for Life Award, which gets £600,000 over three years from this government. So, you know, can you not acknowledge that and see that we are providing the leadership and the finances? Pearson. I'm happy to acknowledge the finance has been given, but it took uh, the Labour Party to bring this debate to the Chamber today. And I would have liked to have seen the Minister coming forward and leading on this issue from their front benches. As, as Alison McInnes indicated, they should play their part in demanding leadership from COSLA, from the football authorities and to all elements of Scottish civic society in recognising the way forward. I would also invite the Minister to give assurances in public that she is prepared to consider the repeal of the legislation that is referred to in the motion when evidence provides the negative impact that has been delivered across Scottish football and the impact on its supporters. I finally invite the Minister to revisit earlier proposals seeking to ensure Football authorities and Scottish clubs particularly play, play their full part in education and delivering true cultural changes in their grounds and are made ac accountable and find themselves accountable for the behaviour of those supporters. I find it difficult to finish this contribution with a continued sniping from the front bench. <laughs> If the Minister wants to ask me something, she merely needs to ask, and I've taken interventions up till now. So I would welcome the Minister ensuring... Would you like to take an intervention from the Minister? I would be delighted. Minister. What I do think... What I do think is that the government should not take responsibility for the duties and responsibilities of the football authorities and should have ensured that those authorities played their full part. So, in closing, I would indicate that as much as I welcome the report, I welcome the contribution, the positive contribution that many people have made to the way forward on this issue. I do hope the government will redouble their efforts in terms of leadership, a visible leadership, and showing us the way forward for the future. Presiding officer, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. And that concludes the debate on tackling sectarianism, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11. 398 in the name of James Kelly on the living wage. I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. 
And Mr. Kelly, when you are ready um, to make your contribution, you will have 10 minutes to do so. And if indeed you are ready now, then I would call on you to do so. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it gives me de great delight to open this debate on the living wage on behalf of the Labour Party and to move the motion in my name. Uh, Labour want to use this debate today to promote Living Wage Week, to welcome the new rate of £7.85 and to discuss as a parliament uh, how we can take this issue forward so that we can ensure that more people within Scotland are paid the living wage. Because the report produced by KPMG at the start of this week, which details the fact that there are 413,000 people in Scotland who are currently not paid the living wage, they're paid uh, the minimum wage or greater, but not the living wage, shows that we still have some way to go uh, in Scotland in order to try and lift these people out of poverty, because the 785 living wage is what is reckoned to be what is required to allow a family uh, to be provided decently uh, and adequately. So I think we need to strive uh, to do more. Because he, among those 413,000, over 64% uh, are women, over a quarter of a, a, quarter of a million uh, women not paid the living wage, and 150,000 between the ages of 16 and 24 uh, key groups within our society. And it's not just about the statistics, it's the real people who are struggling on the ground. It's the cleaners in Cambus Lang, the care worker in Carnoustie, who are struggling to bring up their family with the added burden of rising food prices and also energy prices and uh, trying to get by on a wage uh, which is not adequate. So I think the focus of this debate has to be what can we do to move that forward? And first and foremost, you know, let me uh, begin with the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government um, have put themselves forward as enthusiastic supporters of the living wage. Um, but as we know, earlier in, earlier in the year, when given the opportunity uh, under the Procurement Bill to extend that living wage to everyone on public contracts, the members on this benches voted that, that down. Uh, and that was a hammer blow to those four, over 400,000 people uh, who are not paid the living wage. It was a missed opportunity because of the £10 billion pounds, uh, purchasing power that the Procurement Bill and Procurement, uh, which the Scottish Government uh, fronts up, uh, has the, the opportunity to therefore influence uh, companies that are paying the living wage. And the, the reality that we now have is that as well as some of the companies that the Scottish Government award contracts to not paying the living wage in Scottish Government locations, uh, cleaners at Atlantic Quay and cleaners in Scottish, in Scottish prisons uh, are not paid the living wage. And I think that, that is an issue that has got to be addressed by the Scottish Government. If you want to brand yourself seriously as a supporter of the living wage, you need to make sure that everyone in Scottish Government locations is paid the living wage, and that should be an absolute priority. Now, we heard earlier on in the year that it wasn't possible because it would be subject to a legal challenge. And quite frankly, I said at the time that that was a smokescreen. And the more the issue develops, that's becoming absolutely clear. We only need to see last week that the Department of Energy and Climate Change uh, have announced that all their workers and all their, crucially, all their subcontractors uh, will be paid the living wage. We're always hearing from the SNP about big bad Westminster. And I've got to question why is it that one of these big bad Westminster departments have been able to do what the Scottish Government's not able to do, to pledge that all the subcontractors will be paid the living wage. <laughs> what, why is it that on this issue that the SNP and the Scottish Government are so timid and people like Boris Johnson are able to be more committed on the living wage. And so if, we, if, we're really serious about, if we're really serious about it, Angela Constance, then 
you know, you should do something about it within, within the powers that are within your remit just now. What's interested me uh, in observing the SNP deputy leadership contest, of which Angela Constance uh, is one of the contestants, is seems to be very little, uh, very little differentiation between the candidates. And I've seen in recent TV appearances, Angela Constance has been very keen to support uh, the idea of cutting corporation tax. But on the issue of the living wage, it seems to me that the silence uh, has been deafening. <laughs> let, let me give, let me give, let me just develop this point. Let me just develop this point, Mr. Macdonald, and I'll let you in. Let me give, let me give a bit of free advice to Angela Constance in terms of the deputy leadership contest. Why don't you, you know, why don't you look for something that's a bit different from the other candidates? Why don't you come forward and say that you're committed to the living wage and that you want to see all the subcontractors and all the, all the public people and all the public contracts being paid the living wage? That would set you out from the other candidates and I think that would appeal to a lot of the SNP members. So there, there's a real opportunity for you. Mr Macdonald. Mark Macdonald. I note, uh, I note the member is one of the, uh, the brains trust behind Jim Murphy's leadership campaign, which I suggest already calls into question Mr Murphy's judgment. But nonetheless, would he accept that perhaps one of the ways that this could be taken forward would be for minimum wage powers to come to this parliament to allow us to ensure that anybody is able to be paid a living wage, not just those who are covered by the public sector and public sector contracts? Mr Kelly. Thank the microphone's not... Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. I think you should be a bit more cautious in terms of calling for minimum wage powers. If you can't even use the powers you got to give Scottish Government cleaners and Scottish Government locations the living wage, bring, bring, use those powers first before asking for more powers. And I think one of, the, one of the disappointing things about the Scottish Government's attitude is that uh, they're not providing proper leadership because one of the big challenges in this is that 93% of the people not on the, the living wage are in the private sector. And what we need, if we're going to try and encourage private sector organisations to pay the living wage, we need more leadership from government. We need the government to be more aggressive uh, in promoting that. We saw in the referendum campaign that the SNP were quite, uh, were, were quite aggressive in terms of promoting independence. Why is it we don't see the same energy and aggression around the, the living wage? Because yeah. if you look at some of the sectors that are involved in retail and catering, they need that support. And the momentum is building on it. Only last week we saw Hearts Football Club um, declaring that they were going to pay the minimum wage. We've seen organisations like KPMG also saying that they, were pay, they would pay the living wage. And there are real advantages in terms of falling absenteeism, uh, staff retention, uh, and also increased recruitment. And what all these things mean to businesses is it improves their bottom line, improves their performance as a business. So there are, there are real opportunities there. But the government should be doing more to be up front, more upfront about it. And also, I would suggest that what is required to take this issue forward is we need a, a, a proper living wage unit which will monitor wage levels in the, in the country, monitor the sectors that need uh, attention. And we also need a living wage strategy from the government, something that they can bring to this chamber so that we can all discuss and we can also, we can also have uh, proper consultation uh, on and also regular updates to Parliament. And summing up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think it's absolutely right that uh, people are entitled to fair wages. And I think it's time that this government got serious about the living wage. You need to take your responsibilities and provide leadership. The living wage is an idea uh, whose time has come. But let's see the Scottish Government play their part in its delivery. Let's see the Scottish Government stand up and be counted. And let's see the Scottish Government roll out their activities 
so that we can see some of the 400,000 people currently not on the living wage been taken out of the poverty trap and taken forward on to decent wages. Many thanks. And I now call on Angela Constance to speak to and move Amendment 11398.2. Cabinet Secretary, up to seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. I was looking forward to a nice consensual debate this afternoon. I was very interested that Mr Kelly wants a living wage strategy and a living wage unit, but of course he and his party have ruled out the devolution of employment powers to this Parliament, which is very interesting indeed. Of course, the Scottish Government welcomes the opportunity to participate in this debate, particularly during Living Wage Week. Indeed, I welcome every opportunity this Parliament has to make its voice heard on tackling poverty and inequality. And I recognise how crucial this is to achieving our vision of a successful and fair Scotland. So I want to begin by unequivocally stating here today that in this government's view, paying the living wage should be the expectation and not the exception. And given that it is the living wage week, I also note the very clear call from the major third sector organisations for more powers in Scotland to address the issues around pay and conditions, and in particular, the devolution of the national minimum wage to ensure fairness at work for all. And I would suggest... Not just now, thanks, I'll make progress. And I would suggest that it's Mr Kelly and his colleagues that are rather timid. Presiding officer, in the Scottish Government's draft budget, Mr Swinney focused on three key goals. Uh, to make Scotland a more prosperous country, to tackle inequalities and to protect and reform public services. He also set out commitments to tackle the poverty and inequality that can cripple our society. And these include increasing spending on welfare reform, mitigation, providing additional investment in housing with a strong focus on affordable and social housing, and crucially, confirming our commitment to the living wage and the wider social wage. Because we do indeed recognise the real difference the living wage makes to people in Scotland. I will take you in a minute, Mr Kelly. And this was reiterated on Monday when Mr Swinney supported the announcement of the new increased living wage rate of £7.85 an hour for 2015 and 16. Mr Kelly. Mr Kelly. Uh, I thank Angela Constance uh, for taking the intervention. You spoke about the government's commitment to the living wage in the Scottish budget. Do you accept that there are workers at Scottish government locations who are not being paid the, the, the living wage and what action are you going to take in the forthcoming budget to address that issue? The Secretary. President officer, that leads me really neatly on to the next point because I think a plank of the success of this government is indeed our public sector pay policy. And that is our public sector pay policy that has at its very heart tackling inequality and low pay and our commitment to implementing the living wage is long standing. Because to answer Mr Kelly's point directly, we are the first and the only government in the UK to make the living wage an integral part of our public sector pay policy and have done so for five successive years. And this guarantee to support the living wage in this policy for the duration of this Parliament provides a decisive long-term commitment to those on the lowest incomes. And it truly sets us apart, going well beyond any measures the UK Government has put in place for the lower paid. Briefly. Mr Kelly. Uh, do, you, do you accept that the workers I was talking about are not covered by the public sector pay policy? Nera are the subcontractors, and I can ask again, what action are you going to take to address that deficiency? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, where we have power to act, we act. And unlike Mr. And unlike Mr. Kelly, unlike Mr. Kelly, this government will not participate in gesture politics because I'm pig sick, pig sick of the Labour Party, of the Labour Party always asking this government, procurement being an example, to do things which we, it is illegal for us to do so. So they need, they, need to stop, they need to stop being mischievous and misleading. Where we have the powers to act, we do indeed act. And our record compares very well to the record of the last previous government, because unlike the past Labour government, we have actually implemented the living wage as part of our pay policy. We practice what we preach, presiding officer. 
but we no, no thanks, we're running out of time, Mr. Hendry. But we do indeed want to go further because we believe that employers should reward their staff fairly. And that's why we are calling on all companies across Scotland to follow the Scottish Government's lead and to introduce the living wage. So as well as setting an example in our own pay policy, we have indeed funded a pilot by the Poverty Alliance to promote the take-up of the accreditation scheme and increase the number of employers paying the living wage in all sectors in Scotland. And that campaign is rolling out over 2014 and 15. And I was delighted to hear the Poverty Alliance announce yesterday that the number of accredited living wage employers in Scotland has tripled. And we are also using our powers on procurement to encourage the payment of living wage. The, procure, the Procurement Reform Scotland Act demonstrates our very clear intention to use our powers to put the living wage into public contracts while acting within EU law. The Act will require public bodies to outline their living wage policy in their procurement strategies. It will also see Scottish ministers publish statutory guidance on how workforce matters, including the living wage, should be a factor when selecting those bidding for a contract. And this will be the first time statutory guidance has been put in place to address this issue. And as well as this legislation, we are conducting a pilot project on Scottish Government contracts, which encourages bidders to take a positive approach to their work face package, including the living wage, but also importantly, other terms and conditions. And these measures clearly show that this government is already doing substantially more than that has been done by current UK government and previous Labour administrations, both in Holyrood and Westminster. And following the publication of the Working Together Review, the First Minister announced the establishment of a Fair Work Con Convention. And this will provide leadership on industrial relations and encourage dialogue between unions, employers and public sector bodies and government. And the Convention will exert greater Scottish influence over the minimum wage, while also championing other aspects of good industrial relations, including payment of the living wage. It will indeed be a powerful advocate of a partnership Did approach George and industrial please. relationships in Scotland, and I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon to speak to and move Amendment 11398.1. Ms Scanlon, up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Um, it, it, much of, many of the media are currently saying that politics is changing in Scotland. And I think if they listen to the opening speeches, uh, we have the Labour Party advising SNP candidates in their leadership bid, and we have the Labour Party praising Tory uh, Boris Johnson. And we actually have the Conservative Party agreeing with the Labour Party's motion and uh, the SNP amendment. In fact, I, I found myself, I had to read the motion and amendment a few times, and I thought, I agree with most of what's there. So I went along the corridor to my friend Alec, assuming I would get a huge amount of disagreement. And even Alec agreed with most of what was there. So I hope that the five minutes I have will be a bit more consensual than the previous two speakers. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to the Labour Party for today's debate on the living wage. And uh, we also commend the contribution that the Scottish Living Wage campaign has made to thousands of individuals and families in Scotland. Uh, we too welcome the rise in the living wage to £7.85 uh, per hour from April next year. But I I would like to uh, go back to a point that I've actually been raising now since about May 1999, and uh, that is where the government subcontracts to the care home sector and also subcontracts to the childcare sector. Because whenever we talk about uh, low wages in this parliament, presiding officer, we tend to talk about care workers and we tend to talk about childcare workers. So for too long, the sectors have been highlighted for low pay, and I think alongside that, there is a lack of value for the people who work in these sectors. At a meeting I attended prior to the referendum, I heard that private nursery providers can be paid as low as £2.71 per hour per child to provide childcare. The person at this meeting came from Aberdeen and was highlighting the difficulties recruiting and retaining staff, uh, not just because of the oil jobs, etc., uh, when they were limited themselves in the amount that they could pay. I thought this was untrue, so I asked Spice uh, for a briefing on it. 
And according to SPICE, the National Day Nurseries Association of Scotland state that nurseries are making a big loss on local authority funded childcare places, losing an average of £1,032 per child per year on funded places for three to four year olds, and there is currently not a level playing field on per child cost allocations between public and private provision. Well, I go back to what the Minister said, which was uh, where the SNP have power to act, they will act. So I highlight this because the National Day Nurseries Association go on to say inadequate funding for nursery partner providers for three and four year old places is getting worse and varies widely across 32 local authorities. The lowest rate recorded being £2.71. Uh, pence per hour per child. The knock-on effect is a rise in the cost of parent paid for hours at nurseries are forced to make up for the losses incurred. So I understand that the costings for the current expansion of preschool to 600 hours include an assumption that partner providers will be paid at £4.09 per child per hour. Uh, and I believe this is uh, based on a recommendation. So I, I would like to highlight that sector, but also the care home sector. And I saw Richard Simpson nodding, and I know this is an issue he's raised uh, in the past also. Uh, but uh, the care home sector, the independent and voluntary sector, are limited in the amount that they can pay for care workers because of their funding from government. So I carried out an FOI some months ago, and it was the case that many councils still fund care home places in the council at a significantly higher rate than they pay the independent and voluntary sector. Some in the independent sector per person per week was about 480, and for a place in a council home, over 800 pounds. So my point is that we can all agree that it's right to pay employees the living wage. I've got less, less than 20 seconds left. But when that wage depends on public funding, then the funding should be at a level to allow the operators to pay the living wage, as well as meet the quality training standards, care inspections, health and safety, she and staff to close, patient please. ratios. Uh, so I'm very pleased that... Uh, I'm pleased that I've had a chance to speak in this debate, and I'm four minutes over, seconds over, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. And I now move to the open debate, and I call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Very tight for time today. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I listened to James Kelly with a, a growing sense of bemusement, uh, because Labour have absolutely no credibility whatsoever on this issue. The simple way uh, to ensure that everyone gets a living wage is for the national government with responsibility for employment policy to set the minimum wage at the level of the living wage. Now, Labour didn't just fail to do that. It set the minimum wage too low in the first place and it failed to protect the minimum wage in line with inflation for three out of the last four years in which they were in government in Westminster. If the minimum wage had kept pace with inflation under both uh, Labour and their uh, Conservative allies, it would already be £7.48 per hour compared to the £6.31 per hour which is paid under the minimum wage. The Scottish Government, by contrast, has an excellent record on the living wage, again unlike Labour in office. All staff covered by public sector pay policy, as the Minister said, are paid at least the living wage, uh, as well as a no compulsory redundancy policy as part of a social wage, which also helps low paid families with things like uh, free prescriptions, for example, uh, free tuition at university. The kind of policies which uh, the Labour Party has also um, uh, opposed um, from time to time in this Parliament, suggesting that uh, it was something for nothing. With regard to public procurement, it's very clear uh, that the Scottish Government has gone as far as it legally can within its existing powers to deliver fair wages to contractors, as has been most recently demonstrated in the award of the ScotRail uh, contract to Abilio, which instead of welcoming Labour, condemned. 
The Scottish Government has, of course, explored the possibilities of making the living wage a legally enforceable aspect of every public contract. The Government went so far as to write to the EU Commissioner for Internal Market and Services, uh, Michel Barnier, who replied that the view that in his view a contractual condition to pay a living wage set at a higher level than the general minimum wage is unlikely to meet the requirement not to go beyond the mandatory protection provided in the post of workers directive there is also case law to back up that position from the court of justice of the eu yes i'll take an intervention James Kelly. Uh, th i thank joan mcalpine for taking the intervention can joan mcalpine perhaps explain why the Department of Energy and Climate Change at Westminster is able to ensure that all its workers and subcontractors are going to be paid the living wage, but the Scottish Government isn't able to do that. McAlpine. Well, that, that is not through procurement, but I will address these issues. Um, this, it's not just the Scottish Government, uh, the EU Commissioner, the EU Court of Justice who take this view, the Labour-run Welsh Assembly uh, take this same view, and they don't pay um, the minimum, the living wage as part of their um, employment policy. Labour-round councils in Scotland, including Glasgow, Renfrewshire, West Lothian, Inverclyde, have all responded to FOI requests, stating that their, in their contracts do not include a mandatory requirement that suppliers pay the living wage. And they also say, in response to their FOIs, um, that that's for legal reasons. If I can quote Glasgow's 2014 reply to the FOI, at present, the EU regulations do not allow the living wage as part of a mandatory requirement. That is Labour-run Glasgow Council. I've already taken, I'm in my last minute, and I've Members already taken in an intervention. Minute. If you sit down, please. Um, that advice uh, gives me uh, no pleasure, presiding officer. And for that reason, I uh, echo the minister, and I very much hope that the Smith Commission will heed calls from close, enlightened please. voices in the third sector for powers not Labour, of course, because they, uh, they didn't ask for employment policy to be devolved. But I hope the Smith Commission takes heed close, of more please. enlightened uh, calls for employment policy to be devolved so that we can set this thing to rest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just remind members, it's only the prerogative of the chair to invite members to sit down. Now, you can refuse interventions, of course, freely, but other actions are for the chair to dictate. Mr McIntosh, up to four minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And I suspect that, like me and like most members in this chamber, uh, you walked past the Child Poverty Action Group display in the hall outside this afternoon. And I also suspect that most of us uh, will have stopped to talk and whatever our political party will have shared a common anxiety uh, about the prospect that CPAG flag, flag up, that of rising poverty. It is already to our communal shame that around 220,000 children in Scotland still live in poverty today. Uh, and according to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, that figure could increase by as much as 100,000 over the next five or six years. And the question for us is, what are we going to do about it? Well, I would argue that at least part of the answer must lie in the living wage. Again, like many others in this chamber, I have long believed in the power of work and making sure people have a job so that they can look after themselves and those they care for. But the nature of employment has changed so much in recent years that a job does not always guarantee a route out of poverty. In their recent report, A Fair Start for Every Child, Save the Children estimate that 125,000 children in Scotland are living in families where their parents or carers earned below the living wage. Now, I accept that in-work poverty is a complex issue. In fact, in some ways, the problem of increased underemployment has left as damaging a legacy as the actual joblessness caused by the recession of 2008 onwards. We now have huge numbers of people working part-time who'd rather have a full-time job. Thousands of Scots have been forced to take on work with no security, no prospect of advancement, and more than 130,000 Scots now work without any permanent contract. The number of workers with second jobs is on the rise. In his work, in a second, in his work in the National Performance Framework, I'm also aware that the Cabinet Secretary of Finance has outlined the importance he places, not just on creating jobs, but on creating good, sustainable jobs. Labour colleagues will back him in that task, just as we want him and the SNP to back us in promoting the living wage, using procurement or any other tools at our disposal. Mr Don. 
Nigel Don. I'm grateful for taking the intervention. I think that the, the member has just gone somewhere where I was trying to ask him to go. Surely what is required is not only a sustainable job and the minimum wage, sorry, the, the, the living wage, but also a full-time job, because actually part-time you're simply losing money. In my I, think, uh, I would hope Mr Don would join me in supporting the work of the STUC in the campaign for decent work. Uh, which I think is, is crucial uh, to end exploitative uh, conditions of employment, including zero-hours contracts and other things which this government could do something about. An excellent report which came out last week and which I'd endorsed to all colleagues was from Oxfam entitled Even It Up, uh, Time to End Extreme Inequality. And it argues that inequality is not just damaging to the poorest amongst us, it damages the very fabric of our society. Amongst the many findings it highlights, it reports that in 2014 the top 100 UK executives took home 131 times as much as their average employee. Yet only 15 of those same companies have committed to pay, pay their employees the living wage. Presenting officer, reports such as this remind us that poverty and inequality are not inevitable. They are the result of policy choices, policy choices that we make here in the Scottish Parliament. Yesterday was equal pay day. The day in the year which, because of the gender pay gap, women stop earning relative to men. The gap in pay between men and women is not narrowing. It has been widening in Scotland since 2010. It is yet again an issue we can do something about. Say the Children highlighted that as well as supporting the living wage, we could use childcare uh, policies to develop affordable and, uh, and accessible routes back to the labour market. Children first have pointed to the impact of high housing costs in creating more relative poverty in households. As you draw children. to a close, please. Presenting officer, whether it's housing, childcare, health, social services, or yes, wages and pay policies, we have the tools here in the Scottish Parliament to make a real difference. Many thanks. Now call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think these debates would be improved a lot if we could start from the premise of recognising firstly that it was this government that introduced the living wage in Scotland and I pay tribute to those who campaigned for its introduction uh, and, and brought it to the fore but also that this government has continued to increase the living wage and uh, I, I welcome the latest announcement of an increase and also is doing everything it can to promote the living wage within the powers that are available to it and I'm afraid to say that for Mr Kelly to say that because the Department for Energy and Climate Change have secured uh, the living wage through subcontracts. It's probably through the exact same method through which ScotRail employees uh, will receive the living wage as part of the Abellio contract, i.e. it was not bundled up in the procurement clauses but will have been reached as a result of discussions that took place and a guarantee from the employer on that basis. And I think that's the spirit in which we can move forward within the limited powers that we have until such time as we either receive the clarification uh, or uh, a, a change in decision from Europe or we get to the position where this Parliament has powers over employment policy, such as a minimum wage, as has been uh, put forward in terms of some of the submissions that have gone before the Smith Commission. I want to make some, some progress, if Ms Mara will allow me. I think the, the other point that is important to make is that we have got a situation where the minimum wage has not kept up in terms of the cost of living. That is simply the case. Otherwise, it would be being paid right now, at, as Joan McAlpine says, at around about £7.48 if it kept up in line with inflation, or it would be at the living wage level had it been uh, established as a living wage uh, in, in terms of, uh, of the legislation at Westminster. And I think the, the, the problem I have with the approach that the Labour Party is taking on this is that they are advocating, and they, they say they are advocating an £8 minimum wage, but it will only reach £8 uh, an hour by 2020. And by the time 2020 comes around, if, the, if, the, if, we, if we take the view now that the living wage in 2014 uh, is £7.85 an hour, that would suggest to me that the living wage is going to need to be significantly higher than £8 an hour by 2020, simply if you factor in inflation. So I would say that I think the Labour Party needs to look very carefully at what it's proposing in terms of the minimum wage and how that tallies with the commitment it says it has to a living wage. But I think that the, the other thing that is most important, and I, I think Ken McIntosh, um, in, in his usual way, brought some very interesting points to the debate. And I think this is about, uh, this is wider than just paying the living wage, because there are people out there who don't have work at the moment, and we have to find ways to create the jobs for those people to get into. But when we see those jobs being created, we have to have a situation where those people are being paid 
an appropriate wage. And that's why the minimum wage is the important factor, because we can talk in this chamber about use of procurement. We can talk in this chamber about using uh, the powers that we have to ensure that those in the public sector are paid the living wage. But we then lose sight of the fact that there are a whole range of people employed outside of those spheres who that will not capture. And until such time as the minimum wage catches up with that, that will continue to be the case. So we either have a situation where we have to hope that the powers that be in Westminster will do something radical in terms of the minimum wage and even the policy that the Labour Party has put forward, we, we, we can probably conclude, isn't going, to, uh, you know, isn't going to get to that standard. Or we have the opportunity to perhaps do something radical if the powers are transferred here alongside the Fair Work Commission that this government is establishing. And the last thing I would say, I, I was interested by the point that Mary Scanlon raised around uh, those poor individuals, uh, th those poor companies, sorry, uh, in the independent care sector. All I would say is that I find it very difficult for these companies to claim that they can't afford to pay their staff a living wage because they don't seem to have any trouble paying their chief executives a decent salary. And perhaps they need to take a look at how they're distributing the funding that they receive and ensure that it's going to the frontline staff who are doing a fantastic job in many parts of Scotland. Thanks very much. And I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Uh, that, <clears throat> thank you very much, President Officer. The concept of a living wage isn't too difficult to grasp. Surely it's obvious that no one should be expected to carry out a job that doesn't offer enough money to live on. The living wage is about fairness, it's about equality, it's about human right to the vital services that each of us needs for our health, our homes, our children, our elderly relatives, people with special needs, whether we're disabled or have a learning disability. A living wage is the right to earn enough money to support yourself and your family and to be able to do so at a reasonable level of comfort and security. So why is it so difficult for Westminster to understand? Is it really so much to ask that Ed Miliband does a bit more than drop two pence into a homeless person's paper cup when he realises the cameras are on him? David Cameron admits he has no idea of the price of a loaf of bread. I have a bread maker, he says. He uses Cotswold Crunch flour at £30 a kilo. That works out at £1.88 pence per loaf. Let's say you have a family of four or five then, so that means a cost of £8 a week just for bread. But never mind the cost, because he has a bread maker. But for us normal people, a loaf costs around 50 pence, depending on what offers are available, and that's the normal reality. So I would say get real Westminster. Staring us in the face is the brutality of the gap between the rich and the poor, not so much a gap as a chasm. Did you know that the richest 25 families in the UK own the equivalent of 12 million ordinary folk? The Living Wage Foundation says there are about 60 Scottish-based companies who have signed up to the rate, including Standard Life, RBS and the Scottish Exhibition and Conference Centre, who are all accredited employers. But it's not enough. We need to do more, much more, to prove that work is the surest way out of poverty and to win the buy-in of many, many more companies. Research shows clearly that living wage is good for business, the quality of work is enhanced and absenteeism is reduced, recruitment retention is better. For families, a living wage can mean the difference between being able to feed the kids or running up debts that they can never pay. The living wage is one important component of this Scottish Government's determination to create a fairer, more prosperous and more equal society. A Scotland that begins to close the gap between the rich and the poor. A Scotland that, that values its entire workforce. So let's compare that to Labour. James Kelly is yet to tell us what Labour's plans are for the living wage. £8 by 2020. That's not bold and it's certainly not courageous. In February 2012, the Labour administration at Midlothian Council rejected the SNP proposal for a living wage. Those workers had to wait until an SNP administration came into power and they took the very first decision they took was to introduce the living wage. Whilst Labour whined from the sidelines with fake concern for the workers and did nothing in government, the SNP government implemented the living wage for 180,000 workers in government, its agencies and the NHS, while Labour voted for welfare caps. Whilst Labour whined from the sidelines about the illegal amendments that the SNP government made sure that living wages paid to workers at all levels of the ScotRail franchise, I have yet to hear a Labour Party member say, and especially Mr Kelly, that they welcome that fact. 
Whilst Labour support Tories to run Scotland, they couldn't even ensure their own Smith Commission submission went far enough to give this Parliament the power over the minimum wage or the living wage or any employment policies. We will take no lessons from the Labour Scottish branch office on supporting Scottish workers. This SNP government will put them first, will always put them first, and we will have a living wage with or without Labour's fake concern. Thanks. And I now call on Dr Richard Simpson to be followed by Nigel Dodd. To start, does that Deputy Presiding Officer by welcoming him the opportunity to speak in this debate, but after that last speech, I really wonder. I must ask Christine where she gets her loaf for 50p, because it's not the same world I live in. A 50p 50, a 50 loaf, a 50p loaf is, would be brilliant. The lack of a living wage, underemployment, as Ken McIntosh has said, and zero-hour contracts are terms we should strive to banish to the history books. How can it be that so many hard-working people are either living on a breadline due to the failure of employers to pay a living wage or find themselves having to take multiple jobs? It's appalling that one-fifth of the Scottish working population have paid less than £7.85 an hour, and it can be no surprise, therefore, that many of the lowest-paid staff are having all too often to rely on food banks. 20% of the referrals to the Trussell Trust last year were from people on low pay. We can no longer accept that men and women going out to do a hard graft can then find themselves almost immediately after payday struggling to keep their heads above water or resorting to payday loans or worse. Many of my constituents have shared in the delight in this last few days of Creative Scotland awarding £100 million of taxpayers' money in the form of grants to arts organisations across the whole of Scotland including them at Roberts Centre in my own area, having a three-year £1.2 million grant. When public money is awarded, what safeguards are in place by the government and the bodies that they fund to uh, distribute the public money to make sure that these companies and organisations are responsible employers and paying a living wage to all their staff? I wonder, therefore, if the Minister shares my deep concern that in the case of these many hundreds of organisations that are in receipt of this public money from Creative Scotland, they are not paying their staff the living wage. And I thought the Minister was going to intervene, but she's not. Why has the Scottish Government not taken action to stop this from happening? I hope that my constituents will question the organisations uh, and the person selling the ticket and ushering them into a seat to say, are they being paid the £7.85 an hour? And if not, press the management to do so. Mary Scanlon's... Oh, thank you. The Constance. Thank you, Mr Simpson. Just to briefly say that all cultural bodies are subject to and must comply fully with the Scottish Government's public sector pay policy, which includes payment of the Scottish living wage as a minimum for all staff. That, in that case, these questions are particularly pertinent because the information I've got is that this is actually, actually not happening. So it will be really interesting to see if that, in fact, does, uh, is the case. We will have to get Spice to check it up for it. I want to move on briefly to social care in the time remaining to me. Mary Scanlon's right. It's been a prolonged interest. We've debated it in the first parliament uh, about the fact that unless you actually have staff that are valued and that part of that valuation is wage, then we are never going to improve the social care contract. Uh, and and th this is absolutely vital to our future. The uh, Stirling Council is currently encouraging all its providers to sign up to the Unison uh, Ethical Care Charter, and we're examining aspects of that charter to see what can be delivered just now. There's no doubt living wages, others have said, boost morale. East Renfrewshire, who've got all their independent care providers providing uh, the living wage now, these providers have shown that absenteeism has dropped, uh, that agency staff numbers of requirement have dropped, that their need to recruit new staff has dropped because retention is better. These all offset the costs of the living wage. Uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, I want to commend Stirling Council, who last year backdated the living wage. Um, Christy McKelvey quoted an SNP a group that didn't get it in Midlothian. Well, the SNP group in Stirling didn't introduce it. It took a Labour group to introduce it. So we can all quote areas which, where it's not working. 86% of those As living close. wage people were women. And I think that's an, a critical fact in promoting the living wage. 
Any thanks. I will now call on Nigel Dawn, after which we will move to closing speeches. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I would like to follow particularly where Ken McIntosh went earlier. Um, but I do just need to start where Richard Simpson passed through and note that my constituency, like I fear all of our constituencies, has food banks. And I ask myself why, and when I get the answer, I get quite cross. There's not much makes me cross, actually. But what Richard Simpson failed to pick up, and I'm sorry he did, was that almost half of those who were researched by the Trussell Trust didn't mention low income specifically, but mentioned benefit payments. And I do think we cannot talk about the living wage and poverty within our society without recognising that a great deal of the problems that present themselves immediately to food banks are due to the way the benefit system has been messed around with, quite simply, and it's still not working properly. And if I can reflect on that and just go back to thinking about what does that mean, if you can't feed your children, what are you doing about heating the house or buying clothes? Food's actually quite high up the list. People who are quite literally without food are in a seriously bad place. Their children are in a very, very bad place. And it's got to the point, of course, where they then turn to payday loans. And boy, does that now mean the never-never, because those loans will, frankly, largely never be repaid. We need to sort wages, yes, but we also need to sort benefits. And on the way through, of course, we need to do something about housing quality. But I'd like, presiding officer, to spend my time looking just slightly further afield and looking at the research that's been done more widely. I note, and I, uh, John Swinney commented when introducing the budget about what Adam Smith had had to say, I note that the wealth of nations also, and I quote, no society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. I think even then he knew that equality was important. I don't often bring a visual aid, but the book The Spirit Level should be familiar to absolutely everybody, and I say that as a challenge. If members have not read that and do not know what that says, they really, really should. It's world-leading research done relatively recently because the data has only really recently become available, and it compares most of the developed nations on the planet and, incidentally, all of the American states. It takes comparable social data, and it demonstrates beyond any debate worth having that a more equal society is better for absolutely everybody, be you poor or the richest member of that society. And it really, therefore, is incumbent on absolutely everybody to understand that and to act. Why would government not act? I think the only reason that I can see is because they believe it is in their personal interests not to act. And it might just be that those governments and the government in Westminster is certainly one of them who have sufficient wealth themselves personally may see this is not the way to act. They would still be wrong and I think they, what's in there should really be understood by everybody if we possibly can. I'd like in the remaining time presiding officer just to pick up on the point that uh, Ken McIntosh made about the Oxfam Even It Up report, which I thought was a brilliant piece of work. And again, I would commend that, possibly the executive summary, to everyone who has not yet read it. Trickle down doesn't work. What it does need is some international public policy, particularly on taxation. And I would leave us with a quote from the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. Without deliberate policy interventions, High levels of inequality tend to be self-perpetuating. They lead to the development of political and economic institutions that work to maintain the political and economic and social privileges of the elite. We have it from the top. We have an international problem. But, of course, we do have to solve it locally. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches. And I call on Alex Johnson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. My old friend David McCletchie will be whirling in his grave tonight because the Conservatives propose to abstain on both the Labour motion and the Government uh, amendment. And worse still, the reason why we're going to abstain on both is that we actually pretty much agree with both of them and we don't want to take sides. However, we have a position which we have to make clear, and that is that we have grave concerns about where we could go if we get the issue of the living wage wrong. 
It is vital that we make, uh, pay appropriate attention to making sure that we don't drive up wages in certain sectors of the economy and leave other sectors behind. A divide in our economy is something that serves no purpose and one that we should avoid. And that's why I would commend the government for its very strong stance during the procurement bill earlier this year to make sure that it did not have the effect of doing exactly that. The Labour Party says in its motion today that the living wage in the private sector should be supported and uh, actively promoted. Well, I fully agree with that. But my concern would have been that if Labour had got their will and forced in a clause to the procurement bill requiring the payment of that living wage, then many companies in Scotland would have been excluded from public contracts, and I would not wish to, have see, to see that happen. And I think the reason why that difference in opinion took place was that there is perhaps a failure to understand the true nature of certain parts of the Scottish economy. And I would like to here to take the opportunity to say a few words about the tens of thousands of Scots, many working within Scotland's small and micro businesses, who will never achieve the living wage who will probably never achieve the minimum wage and are working for less than that today. And they are the proprietors. Many of Scotland's small businesses today operate on a model which allows people to work at significantly less than what we would call the minimum wage. Many of them are in our rural economy. Many of them are in our towns and retail and the catering sector. Many of them are family businesses. In fact, many of these family businesses are uh, in the hands of and run by members of our ethnic minority communities. And these are people who struggle to make a living today. And where they employ others, it is necessary for them to control their wages. And that's why we have to dig deep. We have to avoid inequality by going to the very bottom of our economy and working our way back up to the top. It's essential that we focus our efforts, ideally on a cross-party basis and one which doesn't meet, lead to political slagging matches across this chamber, to work together in this chamber and across the United Kingdom to push up wages at the low end of the wage scale, to ensure that we can deliver results for the least well-off in society, the working poor, and deliver that on a, an across-the-board basis. What we're trying to do today uh, from the Conservative side of the Chamber is to indicate that we are not against this effort. We support this priority and we will look for ways to achieve it. But we will bring to this discussion our understanding of how the economy operates and a desire to ensure that whatever happens, nobody is left behind. Thank you very much. I now call on Angela Constance, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I think Nigel Dawn and Ken McIntosh very usefully uh, made contributions that uh, lowered the temperature of the debate by rightly focusing on the impact of low pay on children and families. And with that in mind, I want to highlight the, the briefing um, sent to us all by Children's First, who very eloquently put it uh, that you know, we need to ensure that parents um, are better paid and have less of a need to work longer hours in order to make work pay, because that puts a real strain on relationships with parents struggling to spend any meaningful time with their children. And we also know that low pay also results in poor access to mainstream financial services, which in turn results in reliance on services like payday loans, uh, causing issues with debt and further depressing already low incomes. Uh, families uh, also in low paid work are also increasingly uh, suffering from food poverty, as mentioned by many members, and are having to rely on food banks uh, to be able to feed their families. And we know that the cost of heating and lighting bills are also pushing far too many uh, families into poverty. And I think we're all agreed that work is indeed the, the best way out of poverty. And there were certainly a few members that very rightly made the connection between the living wage and uh, equal pay. 
And I very much, as the Women's Employment Minister, want to see uh, the resolution uh, of equal pay cases uh, in both the public and private sector. And as a government, we've offered the, the facility a consent to borrow, in other words, capitalisation, to insist our partners and local government uh, with settling these equal pay claims, not just now. And I've also noticed that in the UK, uh, the second largest retailer, uh, Asda, is now facing uh, a massive legal action, the largest uh, of its kind. So whether in the public or the private sector, as an employment minister, I very much call on all these organisations uh, to get this matter sorted. And I hope, through the good work of the Fair Work Commission, that we can indeed build a consensus working in partnership between employers and trade unions and pursue that vision of increased employability, but also uh, tackling inequality in the workplace. But I do, of course, bitterly regret that this parliament doesn't have the powers to actually make it happen. And Mr Kelly, in his opening remarks, uh, spoke about DEC. And I just want to say that I very much understand uh, what that UK government department is doing, and I understand why they're doing it. But I also understand what they are not doing. They are not making it mandatory to pay the living wage as part of procurement. They are one very small part of the UK government and the UK government do not pay all of their staff the living wage. And it is indeed the Scottish government, the first government, the only government in the UK that pays all of its staff the living wage. Maybe later, we have 3,000 staff that have benefited from the living wage increase and 30% of Scottish government staff will benefit from the minimum increase of £300. And after ensuring that all of our own staff are paid the living wage, uh, part of our public policy is now considering all of our contracts through pilots on the living wage through procurement. And that is having very positive results indeed and will help us move forward and will indeed inform uh, statutory guidance, which was very welcomed by, by key figures. I was very interested, presiding officer, that no one in the Labour benches actually mentioned Ed Miliband and his proposal to increase the national minimum wage by £8 by the year 2020. I wonder if that's because Ed Miliband is now more unpopular than David Cameron in Scotland. And of course, we know that 65% of Labour supporters no longer feel that Labour represents them. And I think it's very salutary that the former Labour Minister, Alan Milburn, who chairs the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission, described Ed Miliband's proposals as not at all ambitious, as it implies a slower rate of increase in the national minimum wage from 2014 to 2020 than there was between 1999 and 2014. And the shameful part of both the UK government's record, whether it's Tory or Labour, is that the national minimum wage has not increased in real terms for a decade, because if it had, 63,000 people in Scotland would have earned £600 a year more over the last five years. And the problem with everything that we've tried to do in procurement is that the national minimum wage is set in law. It's at a lower rate than the living wage, which is not set in law. And if I can end, presiding officer, by just kindly reminding my colleagues on Labour benches that it was they, not I, who stood with the Tories to campaign against this parliament, having all powers over employment. So I wonder, my challenge to them is, will they join with us now in seeking all the powers to tackle low pay in this country and to equip the Scottish Parliament with all the powers to create more jobs, to tackle inequality and to protect public services. Will they, like us, join with the major voices and the major third sector organisations calling for the devolution of the national minimum wage, key welfare policies and significant tax powers, reflecting that broad consensus that exists in Scotland that we need to be setting our own direction. Presiding officer, we have an opportunity to act where Westminster has failed. Thank you very much. I now call on Jenny Mara to wind up the debate. Ms Mara, until five o'clock, please. Thank you, presiding officer. 
Presiding Officer, uh, Labour is delighted to, to introduce this uh, debate today in uh, Living Wage Week. And I would say to the Cabinet Secretary, she makes her first uh, mistake of today, but I think of her whole political career and her deputy leadership campaign, in fact, by confusing power with political will to make change happen. Because all of her colleagues today have made this confusion that if you have the power vested in one place, then change and change for the better will happen. And I would like to correct the Cabinet Secretary on that today, that there needs to be, there needs to be political will and economic and social analysis, which her party does not have, to raise wages and make social change. Power is not exactly a, di a direct answer to that. No, I'll take interventions later. Presiding officer, uh, James Kelly made three asks in his opening speech this afternoon. The first is that the Scottish Government use the power that they have in their hands to use their procurement to give the living wage to contractors. He also made a second ask for, the living for a living wage unit in government, a very easy thing for Angela Constance to commit to this afternoon. And his third ask was for, no, I'll give way in a minute, uh, was for the government to put together, I will give way, a living wage strategy. Presiding officer, can I come on to the first point about procurement and contractors? The SNP this afternoon has said that they do not have the legal power to do this. Presiding officer, that is simply not true. It becomes clearer by the day and by the hour that they do have the power in their hands. We came here for a debate six months ago and I said to Nicola Sturgeon that she had the power. She said she didn't, but Alex Salmond was going off to Brussels on Monday to ask for it. Well, he went to Brussels, presiding officer, and he was told by the EU that there was no European law in place which prevents, yes, because he cited European law, there was no European law in place which prevents the Scottish Government going ahead with its proposal to give the living wage to contractors. No reason at all. And that was reported in the press. I'll give way in a minute. And then this week, I will give way just this week, we saw the Department for Energy and Climate Change give the living wage in to all employees, including third party contractors. Will the Cabinet Secretary accept that cleaners down in Westminster and DECC will get the living wage, but the cleaners down in Atlantic Kiefer, her government, will not get the living wage? Angela Constance. I wonder if Ms Mara would find it in her hard heart to welcome the announcement made by the First Minister last week about a Fair Work Convention, which is about how we can move forward together on many of the issues raised by Mr Kelly. But will she not accept, accept some facts that the correspondence from Commissioner Barnier, the posting of Workers' Director, the Rufert European Court of Justice eh, case law, all identify that the problem is that our national minimum wage is set in law and that it's lower than the living wage. Surely to goodness she can accept that the real issue is about this parliament having powers over the national minimum wage. How do you affect change if you don't have the power to do so? No, Jerry Mara. Presiding officer, I do not accept what the Cabinet Secretary just said. Of course we welcome the, the Work Commission. That is a, a very good thing. But the decision by the ECJ was not on contractors. It was on collective agreement, not mandatory legislation. So the decision in that case was actually completely different. And the Deputy First Minister cited it in this debate six months ago. It's not relevant to the point. Or, if it was, why would the Department for Energy and Climate climate change yeah, yeah. go ahead and yeah, award yeah. the living wage to their contractors. <laughs> Presiding officer, yes. Yes. Matt McDonald. Would the member not accept that the agreement that was reached by the Department for Energy and Climate Change, like the agreement that was reached in terms of the ScotRail contract by the Scottish Government, was not uh, about procurement and that is the point that has been made repeatedly to her during this debate. It was not part of the procurement process. Jenny Mara. President officer, I would say to the member the Department for Energy and Climate Change is awarding the minimum the, sorry the living wage to all employees, including third party contractors. If they can do it, then the Scottish Government can do it as well. You know, Presiding Officer, it was just last week 
The SNP keeps shouting for more powers, but they will not use the power within their own hands. It was just last week when I argued that they should award contracts to sheltered workplaces in Scotland using the precious procurement powers in their hands. They refuse to do so. They issue guidance. And again today, the Cabinet Secretary says that she's only prepared to go as far as to issue guidance to contractors to pay the living wage. She is not prepared in the face of legal evidence to actually go ahead and do it. And, Presiding Officer, let me clarify for the record, there's been much said this afternoon about the Labour Party's record on this. Let me clarify this for the Scottish Parliament. In 1997, the Labour Party won a majority across this United Kingdom. And in the face of opposition from the Conservatives, from business, from the CBI, and many quarters against the minimum wage, we marched through the House of Commons, through the lobbies that night. But where were the SNP? <laughs> Presiding officer, cabinet secretary, that night, that night, on the most ground, on the most groundbreaking anti-poverty wage-related legislation that we have seen in this country in decades, the SNP were asleep in their beds. And I will take no lessons from the Cabinet Secretary or any of our backbenchers on our record on this. And for nine years, and for nine years, Order. Mark Macdonald. I wonder if the member can advise the chamber, did Tony Blair vote in that very same division? I seem to recall he was absent from it. Jenny Mara. If that is the best that the member can come up with, then I am very disappointed. The amount of votes that Mr Salmond is not here for. And here we are again. The legal case on this is absolutely clear, and it becomes clearer again with the actions of the Department for Energy and Climate Change this week. But despite this, the SNP still refuse to use, use the power that they have, the generous power of procurement, to raise wages in this country and raise the wages for people that are even cleaning their own offices down in Edinburgh. The SNP say they need more powers, but they're not even using the powers they've got on important poverty wages in this country. It is an absolute disgrace and I think they should be voting for the Labour motion this evening. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the living wage. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 11409 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business motion. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now. Move. Um, in moving the, the, the business motion, I think there's some very important business. Um, on Tuesday, we have human rights. On Wednesday, welfare benefits for people living with disabilities. Um, saying officer, I wasn't sure I was going to have some extra time here. Um, and on Thursday, very important debate on progressive workplace policies to boost productivity, growth and jobs, which Ms Constance will lead on. That was admirable, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11409, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11410 on the designation of a lead committee and motion number 11411 on the office of the clerk. Moved. The questions on these motions will put decision time to which we now come. There are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment number 11395.1 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, which seeks to amend motion number 11395 in the name of Elaine Murray on tackling sectarianism be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now.
the result of the vote on Amendment 11395.1 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is as follows. Yes, 68. No, 49. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11395 in the name of Elaine Murray as amended on tackling sectarianism be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 11395 in the name of Elaine Murray as amended is as follows. Yes, 68. No, 50. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11398.2 in the name of Angel Constance, which seeks to amend motion number 11398 in the name of James Kelly on the living wage be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. Result of the vote on amendment number 11398.2 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 39. There were 15 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11398.1 in the name of Mary Scanlon, which seeks to amend motion number 11398 in the name of James Kelly on the living wage be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11398.1 in the name of Mary Scanlon is as follows. Yes, 15. No, 103. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11398 in the name of James Kelly as amended on the living wage be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 11398 in the name of James Kelly as amended is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 37. There were 17 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11410 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the designation of a lead committee be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. 
The next question is at motion number 11411, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on the office of the clerk, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.